Greetings, my brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. We're going to continue with rightly dividing the word of God. And in this video, we're going to be covering who was the book of Hebrews written to. And not just the book of Hebrews, but every other book from Hebrews up through the book of Revelation. Because these books are very important. Because in these books, God is laying out instructions on how you can avoid his wrath to come during the seven year tribulation. And I'm telling you right now, you need to learn how to rightly divide all of this. Because these books talk about a lot of different things that may get you confused about your current salvation in Christ in the age of grace. And you're gonna love what you hear here because once again, it's gonna confirm your security, your salvation in Jesus Christ, in the body of Christ. And you're going to see in this video here more incredible revelations in rightly dividing the word of God that proves once again you are saved and you can never lose your salvation. The moment you believe in your heart the saving gospel of grace from God through his works of his son Jesus Christ at the cross. And once you believe in that God instantaneously seals you in the body of Christ. And this happens in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. And one day, this corporate body of Christ that God has been adding members to for the last 2,000 years, just like he added you and myself, one day this body will be complete. Everyone involved in this body will receive their final rewards involved with this, and that will be new immortal bodies at the rapture resurrection and then god will have to call this corporate body home to heaven because this body is a celestial body a corporate body of believers that dwell eternally in the heavens celestial heavenly get it we're not terrestrial as you get the word terrain from which means earthly and Apostle Paul addresses the differences between the terrestrial and the celestial bodies in 1 Corinthians 15, 40. Just 11 verses prior to where he addresses the rapture resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, 51-53. You have to understand something. Even though these verses are divided up by numbers, it's still the same conversation, the same instruction that Paul is giving to the body of Christ. And in the same chapter, in the same conversation, Paul also gives us the gospel of our salvation here in the age of grace in 1 Corinthians 15, same chapter, verses 1 through 4. So the whole chapter is just incredible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, awesome. It explains start to finish how we get saved, who we are eternally with God, a celestial civilization in heaven, and how this celestial civilization receives their celestial bodies and how they are transported to their celestial eternal destination. So let me show you what he says about the terrestrial and the celestial in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 40. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is is another two different types of immortal eternal bodies they are both glorified but one is celestial and one is terrestrial one's of the earth and one is of the heavens and both of them had different pathways to the creations and since they both had different pathways this means they both have different gospels a different set of instructions that's used to create them. Both of them have different eternal destinies. So they both have different pathways, different destinies, different gospels. And our gospel for the body of Christ, the eternal celestial human civilization in God's kingdom was given to us by God through our spokesman that God chose 
to deliver the message, who is Apostle Paul. The terrestrial body that stays here on the earth eternally, and even on the new earth, is corporate Israel, God's chosen elite for the earth. All their dead that will be resurrected and their living. Why do you think the whole world wants to destroy them? Why do you think the word of God says that the whole world will come against Israel? They don't want to be under Israel's rule. They want to rule themselves. But sorry, that's not going to happen. All Gentile nations of the world will eventually be under the rule of Israel, which is also under the rule of King David, who is under the rule of Jesus Christ, our Messiah. The whole world is trying to stop Israel from becoming their ruling kings. And it says in Revelation 1, verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Why do you think the whole world will come against Israel? Why do you think the whole world wants to destroy them? Why do you think the devil and all his minion Muslim nations and so on and so forth want to wipe them off the map? They ultimately, in the end, don't want to be ruled by them. Makes sense? So God has ordained them to be eternally here in the first heavens, the earth. And we who are the body of Christ, we are ordained to be eternally in the second and third heavens. And we get to experience the heavens where they are now. And we get to live in the new heavens when God creates the new earth. And since we are celestial, we are able to come and visit earth as much as we want. Stay here, hang out for a while, and then go to the second and third heavens. So it's going to be incredible. And some may argue that, no, we can never come to the earth. Well, you know, our apostle Paul... He was a citizen of Jerusalem and also a citizen of Rome. So I think we see a parallel or a shadow or a pattern there. Just saying. And besides, why would God not want us to see the glory of his new Jerusalem established on earth? So enough from me. Let's get into the study with Pastor Rodney again. And here he's going to be talking about the book of Hebrews through the book of Revelation. And why it was not written to the body of Christ, but it was written to... The Hebrews. That's why it's called the book of Hebrews. And moving forward through the book of Revelation. Open your Bibles this morning. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. <clears throat> if you remember last week, we went from time past, but now, and ages to come. We did not focus on Hebrews to Revelation because the purpose of last week's message was to show that the Gentiles were not in the program of God. They had been separated way back then when God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. And we went all the way until Acts chapter 9 <clears throat> and showed where the Apostle Paul, Saul, was saved. So today, I want to begin looking at Hebrews through Revelation and show that after the catching away of the church that God is dealing with Israel again. I'm sure you remember this from last week. You know, we have to raise this projector, John. Because that's way down there. That's way too low. You know how to do that? The little switch on the front there? Yep. R lift it. Yeah, there you go. Now, yeah, there you go. That might be a little too high. No, that's good. You might have to readjust the camera, but that's okay. Sorry about that. Anyway, I'm sure you remember this from last week. Among many things, this timeline also shows you that God is not the author of confusion. God is organized. God does everything decently and in order. And he makes divisions in his words, in his word. Divisions that you can follow easily. Genesis to Malachi, Matthew to John, Acts, Romans to Philemon, Paul's epistles. The, the, well, we'll cover all that later, but you don't need a degree from a Christian university to understand the simplicity 
of the Word of God. I realize that Christian universities are highly regarded among Christians today, but you know what? They thought that about Jesus Christ too. Uh, we read in John 7, 14, now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught, and the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man's letters? How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? See, they were guilty of regarding education as a necessary qualification to speak intelligently about a certain subject or something. They thought that was mandatory. Well, that thinking is not a recent development. That's something that existed back then. Notice in Acts 4.13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. See, God never put a premium on higher education. The ones who said that Jesus Christ had never learned were implying that he was not qualified to teach. And they're the ones of whom Jesus Christ said in Luke chapter 11, verse 52, Woe unto you, you lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. It is the same thing today. The teachers who are not entering in, they're not entering into an understanding of the Word of God the way God designed it to be rightly divided, hinder those who want to know about this. Enter those, they hinder those who want to understand this wonderful truth that they're supposed to be teaching anyway. And those who would enter, hinder in, they Those that would enter in, they hinder. I remember a long time ago, I sat with a family. We were all, we were at, they were going to the church on the hill. We had left. We were rightly dividing. And I went over to their house. And they were asking about water baptism. And so I, I was teaching them about what the Bible had to say about water baptism. And one of the questions that I asked them that day was, when John the Baptist arrived on the scene, and he was baptizing people in the Jordan River, where did he get the instructions to do that? Why all of a sudden this guy, a voice crying out of the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, and people come out of, Jeru out of Judea, and they come and they're baptized in the Jordan River. Where did he get the instructions to do that? Well, their 13-year-old son was listening to this conversation. He attended the academy up there. That's where he went to school, the Christian academy. And the pastor was teaching a class. On, on that Monday morning, that kid goes to, that, goes to school, and the teacher, the teacher starts teaching a class, and the young, that boy raised his hand and said, where did John the Baptist get instructions on water? Why was he baptizing in the Jordan River? And the pastor said, I will answer that later. And then after the class, he took the boy aside and said, don't you ever ask me a question like that in public again. <laughs> right? And then they relayed that story to me. So, they enter in not themselves. And them that are entering in, they hinder. You've taken away the key of knowledge to those who would enter in. So you don't need a degree to understand the simplicity of the Word of God rightly divided. I mean, last week we, we basically uh, got up to here. Uh, notice this fine line, oops. Notice this fine line that I put in here. I mean, that's where we got up to last week to the fall of Israel. That's where Israel fell. And God separated, God postponed the prophetic program, introduced the, in, the dispensation of grace, and that's the line of demarcation between time past and but now. This bottom line, this is Acts 9, this bottom line continues all the way to Acts 28, and you notice how the dispensation of grace 
overlaps that period. Because the dispensation of grace began with Saul of Tarsus, the transition period, one of the most difficult sections of scripture for people to understand, but it is what it is. I don't know, I probably didn't ask you to turn to Romans 11, but I'm going to put everything up here anyway. Paul said, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Now, I want you to understand the diminishing of Israel took place and it's represented by this line that takes us from Acts 9 to Acts chapter 28. The diminishing of Israel means that they grew smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and the gospel of grace and the growth of the body of Christ increased and increased and increased throughout the book of Acts. That's the diminishing of Israel and the expansion and the growth of the body of Christ. See, until Acts chapter 9, the only program that existed in the world was the kingdom program. That's all anybody knew. That's what they preached. And then in Acts chapter 9, upon the stoning of Stephen, and God postponed Israel's program and Israel fell, Israel began to diminish. They began to shrink. And God temporarily, <clears throat> it's been a long temporary, it's been like, you know, over 2,000 years now, but they've been temporarily set them aside. Now, at the same time that Israel was diminishing, God's new program was growing. It didn't grow all at once. There was a process. There was progress as this program was getting unto the way. The body of Christ was being formed. And that program was growing. Now notice again, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Well, the diminishing of them was the riches of the Gentiles. In other words, as they, as they diminished, the Gentiles were brought into the program. That would be you and me. And it was through their fall and the subsequent diminishing that the dispensation of the grace of God began to flourish. So Paul's gospel of grace progressively replaces the gospel of the kingdom. See, that's your transition period. That's what happened in the transition period in the book of Acts, the transition period is approximately 30 years long. The fall of Israel and the introduction of the dispensation of grace put a brakes on the law. It put brakes on the law and although some law things kept being practiced, they were losing, they were losing ground because God had dropped the dispensation of grace into the world. See? And so the dispensation of grace, after the, after the fall of Israel, this is where we're at now. We're in the full blown out dispensation of grace. One day this dispensation is going to end with the catching away of the body of Christ and God will reintroduce the prophetic program right where he stopped it with Israel, right there. And then Israel will go into the, uh, the tribulation period after the rapture of the church. That is the subject of Hebrews to Revelation. And the point I want you to see is this. When they wrote these books, Hebrews to Revelation, they wrote with the tribulation period and the second coming of Jesus Christ in view, not the dispensation of grace. They weren't talking about this 
because this is over. They were talking about this. So I asked you to get Hebrews chapter 1, right? And it's so fitting that after the rapture, God will resume his dealings with Israel that he names the first book after the dispensation of grace, the book of Hebrews. It's to the Hebrews. How fitting and how perfect and how appropriate is that? Now it's so obvious when we arrive at the book of Hebrews that the scenery changes, the landscape completely changes. We're introduced to concepts that are oriented towards Israel exclusively. I know, you know, people find, somehow they find the body of Christ in these epistles because spiritual language oftentimes is similar. But the context always determines what it means. Now, this may sound strange to some people, but these writers did not understand the doctrines of grace that had been given to the Apostle Paul. The people who wrote this as they were writing this, they didn't understand what was given to Paul. Salvation by grace through faith apart from the works of the law. They did not understand that. Now, if this sounds strange to you, and I know from personal contact with many people that these words that I'm speaking sound strange to their ears. I went to a funeral with Sal one time and there were people there and he wanted me to talk to them about uh, the dispensation of grace and one of them was a Sunday school teacher at a church not far from here and he was angry that we said 1 Peter was not written to the body of Christ. I mean, he actually got angry, angry and told me that I was a wacko and that I was out of my mind. Do you remember that? Yeah. <clears throat> well, the only reason that sounds strange to them is because their pastor never taught them that the Hebrew epistles were written to Israel as they're going through the tribulation period. Now, I can't help it what other pastors are teaching their people. You know, that's not my responsibility. You know, in this church, we teach the word of God rightly divided, and I'm responsible for what I teach here. And I try to make these things as clear as I possibly can so that you'll understand that there are dispensational truths that don't apply to us. Now, for, I want to just interject something here, okay? In Galatians chapter 2, as a matter of fact, I was speaking to a guy. He's a Sunday school teacher in a Presbyterian church in Georgia. He called me a few weeks ago. Told me he's been watching all my videos on YouTube and he's getting ready to introduce this to his church. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> like when Don called me, said, okay. Bye -bye. Yeah, they're going to, you know, get ready to have them kick you out of there because you're not going to, you know. So I wish I had done with Don what I did with this guy because I told him what to do. I said, here, okay, now here's what you need to do. You need to go to Galatians chapter 2 and explain these verses. And so, verse 7, but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So there's two gospels here, one's given to Peter, one's given to Paul. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostle of the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go to the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So you got Peter, James, and John. You got the book of Hebrews. You got 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, uh, James, uh, James, uh, yeah, Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Peter, James, and John. And right here it tells you who they're writing to. It's not a secret. This should not catch anybody off guard. If somebody's pastor hasn't taught them this, they should say, oh, I wonder why my pastor never taught me this. Not, my pastor doesn't teach that. No, why didn't your pastor ever touch this? Okay? So the, 
they've agreed who they're going to write to. I told the guy, that's the first thing you really need to introduce your people to before you even talk about time passed but not ages to come, that there's something that happened. Paul's talking to you. Peter, James, and John are talking to the circumcision. You're not the circumcision. There's a distinction there. Okay? So when we get to Hebrews chapter 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, after the catching away of the church, after the rapture, you're at once introduced to people to whom the prophets had spoken to. Well, you know, and I know, that in time past, when the prophets were speaking, they were not talking to you. They were not talking to the Gentiles. We know that the prophets did not talk about the church, the body of Christ. We know that that was a secret. The body, this dispensation of grace was a secret hid in God in time past. We know that. So keep your finger in Hebrews and look at Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. We mentioned this verse last week at the very end, but didn't have time to stop and smell the roses. So in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, the verse said that God spake unto the fathers by the prophets. In Acts chapter 7, verse 51, notice he's, Stephen is preaching. He says, You stiff-necked stiff -necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before the of the coming of the just one, whom, of whom ye have now been the betrayers and murderers. So God did speak to them by the prophets, but they were so stiff-necked, they could not listen to God. So when God did speak in time past to Israel by the prophets, they rejected. They rejected what the Father said to them, which is an important point to take note of. They rejected what God the Father spoke to them in time past. They also rejected the Son. Now in Hebrews chapter 1, notice verse 2 hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Now where does this verse say these people are? In the last days. In the la where did Peter say he was when he spoke at Pentecost? When Peter spoke right here at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, Peter said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, it shall come to pass in the last days. In the last days. The last days were here, according to Peter. They were postponed, and the dispensation of grace interrupted the last days. After the catching away of the church, the last days are reintroduced again. See, we're not in the last days in the dispensation of grace, although there are some last days to the dispensation of grace, obviously. It's possible we're approaching those last days of the dispensation of grace. But there's an important concept that's embodied in the words, God spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Because when did the Son of God speak to Israel? He spoke to Israel during his stay on earth. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. While he was here, Jesus Christ said this in Matthew chapter 12. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy, shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. 
And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall never be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now in the old economy, it was God the Father who spoke to Israel. Oh, it's not up there, sorry. It was, not, it was God the Father who spoke to Israel. They rejected God. When Jesus Christ came, it was the Son who spoke to Israel. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. They rejected him. But he said to them, you speak about, he didn't say here, you speak about my Father, but they were forgiven. You speak against the Son, it shall be forgiven you. So they rejected the Father, they rejected the Son, they killed him. On the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. Now, you need to understand this, okay? When Jesus Christ spoke these words, when Jesus Christ spoke these words back here, and he said, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven you. There are people today who think that they've blasphemed the Holy, that they've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. I've had people email me. I said this when I was younger. Did I blaspheme God? Did I, am I guilty of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Okay, I'm going to show you how that's not possible. Because there's a specific place and time for the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. When Jesus Christ was here, and he said this, blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Ever. You need to understand this. In John chapter 7, verse 38, he said, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. You need to understand, during... The earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit that they could blaspheme wasn't even here. You understand that? They could not blaspheme against the Holy Spirit because he wasn't given. It was only after the resurrection. It said because he was not yet glorified. When was Jesus Christ glorified? After his resurrection is when he was glorified. So, after his ascension into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down at the Feast of Pentecost. And Jesus Christ said, if you blaspheme him, there will be no more forgiveness. Because remember on the cross, Jesus Christ said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But when he said those words, the Holy Spirit still was not here. So the Holy Spirit came on the Jewish Feast of Pentecost. That's where they received that one year extension of mercy. And that's where they, the, the apostles of Christ pleaded with them through the power of the Holy Spirit to repent and repent of the murder of their king so that their kingdom could be established. In Acts chapter 7, when they stoned Stephen, and he said they resisted the Holy Spirit. They resisted the Holy Ghost. That's when they did it for the last time. That's where they were cut off and God turned to the Gentiles. So they rejected the Father. They rejected the Son. And the ultimate rejection of the Holy Spirit was in Acts chapter 7. They found forgiveness for rejecting God. They found forgiveness for rejecting the Son. But when they rejected the Holy Spirit, that's where they blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. And that's where... He says, not even forgiven in the world to come. Not even forgiven in the world to come. So now, here we are, almost at the catching away, almost at the rapture, and we get to the book of Hebrews. Now I want to throw in a verse, which I don't think I put up here. It's Acts chapter 2. Verse 29, Men and brethren, 
Let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Well, I didn't put that thing up there, but this is where Israel, before this came in, this is where they were headed. They were headed to the throne. They were headed to a kingdom where Jesus Christ would sit on a throne. But their program was interrupted upon the fall of Israel. And the concept of the throne was postponed. Today, Jesus Christ is not sitting on a throne. Jesus Christ is in your heart by faith. Now look, you're in Hebrews chapter 1, right? I want you to notice that when you arrive to the book of Hebrews after the dispensation of grace is over, the concept of the throne, which speak, Peter spoke of here in Acts chapter 2, which is postponed here, is reintroduced again. Notice Acts chapter, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And the angels, he say, and of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, is the scepter of thy kingdom. So here the, the, in verse 8, thy throne is reestablished. The throne is reintroduced again. And here we are going into the tribulation period. And then after that, into the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And the first thing that the Holy Spirit inspires the writers of the book of Hebrews is reintroduce the throne. Bring this concept back. Because now Israel is going towards this after the tribulations period. So I said that the scenery changes when you arrive at Hebrews. Hebrews. Notice verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the, work of the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. This is talking about, remember we talked about the restructuring of everything will be changed uh, when your adoption is complete. Remember that, Romans chapter 8? These verses that you just, we just read, verses 10 to 12 in Hebrews chapter 1, they're the fulfillment of Psalm 102, verse 25. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Thy children, or the children of thy servants, shall continue their seed, shall it be established forever. Why is the writer to the Hebrews speaking like this? Well, he's looking forward into the tribulation period and the second coming of Jesus Christ, not the dispensation of grace. That's why. That's why the book of Hebrews is talking in language like this. Those things are not going to happen during the dispensation of grace. I was talking to somebody just a couple of days ago, say prophecy is not being fulfilled today. You know, prophecy is postponed. Now, things are getting ready for the prophetic program to be put in place, that's for sure. But prophecy has been postponed. And prophecy had nothing to do with the body of Christ. Now, notice also Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? When do angels show back up on the, on the scene? In the tribulation period. They're opening seals, they're blowing trumpets. And they're heirs of salvation. 
Did you know that as a member of the body of Christ, you are not an heir of salvation? You're not an heir of salvation. You got salvation by grace through faith. Salvation was given to you based upon your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and that you're trusting in His blood to forgive you of your sins. But you're not an heir. You're not inheriting salvation. See the difference? They are going to inherit salvation at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then notice Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Notice verse 3, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. Well, when did the Lord speak of so great a salvation? Well, for Israel right here. In the four Gospels. Notice the last part of verse 3. It was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Now notice how it was confirmed by them that heard him. Verse 4. That's the 12, by the way. Them that heard him is the 12. Verse 4 of Hebrews 2. God also bearing them, the disciples that heard him, witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. When did God bear witness with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost? When did God do that? In the first seven chapters of the book of Acts is where the apostles that heard him confirmed the word with signs and wonders and diverse miracles of the Holy Ghost. What were those miracles for? They were to verify and prove the claims of the Messiah. They were to confirm to Israel that Jesus Christ was their Messiah and he was who he had said he was. Now, at this juncture, they're going into the prophesied program. Hebrews, they're going into the prophesied program. Notice verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. Now notice, where is the world to come? This is it right here. This is the world to come. Jesus Christ, you won't be forgiven. You won't be forgiven for blasphemy in this world or in the world to come. That He was pointing to this. The writer to the Hebrews says the world to come, that's the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, and the, the, the writer to the Hebrews says Whereof we speak. That's what I'm talking about, he says. When you're in the book of Hebrews, he says, I'm talking about the world to come, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on the earth for a thousand years. That's why we say the book of Hebrews is writing with the prophetic program in view, with the tribulation in view. Also, the second coming of Jesus Christ in view. It's also called the second time in the revelation of Jesus Christ. The last book of your Bible, that's what it's called. The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, because in this chapter, the writer to the Hebrews lets you know without a shadow of a doubt who he's speaking to. He lets you know he's not speaking to the body of Christ. Nothing is clearer than this in the entirety of the book of Hebrews. I said, this is also called, by the way, the second coming. The second coming. When he comes the second time. It's also called that. Okay? Notice in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation there's a lot of information we could look at about this coming the second time but when Jesus Christ comes at the rapture that's not the second time 
That's a secret, a secret appearing. That's his first time. That's the second time. Let me show you another reason why the book of Hebrews is not being written to you. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. What happened to these people in the first chapters of the book of Acts? They received the knowledge of the truth. They received the knowledge of who Jesus Christ was. This Jesus whom ye crucified, he's the son of God. They received that knowledge. They were clear on that. They were told who he was. And they knew who he was because the disciples confirmed their word with signs following to validate and substantiate what they were saying. This is how you know what we're saying is true. <coughs> you're blind, you see. You're lame, you walk. You're dead, you rise. They were confirming it. They had no reason not to believe. So they had received the knowledge of the truth. When they stoned Stephen, they also were at the same time rejecting the one sacrifice that had been given for them. They were also rejecting the Son of God. And the writer to the Hebrews who wrote this book in verse 26 said, If ye sin willfully after that ye have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for you. You receive the knowledge of the truth. If you sin willfully after that, there remains no more sacrifice for you. But what? But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation. That's this. That's the tribulation period. That's what you've got to look forward to. which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, notice, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. When the Holy Spirit pled with them in Acts chapter 7 to receive their Messiah, to repent of what they had done. And they had done despite unto the Spirit of grace. He says, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who have done that. And this is as a result of that, you fall and you are going through the tribulation period. That's where they blaspheme the Holy Spirit right here upon the stoning of Stephen. And they're not forgiven. Now you might say, why was Paul forgiven? Well, I have a message on the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. It's on our website. You want to listen to that? I go through all a lot more detail about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit in that message. Because Paul was forgiven. And he's the one that held the coats when they stoned Stephen. He was guilty of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Why was he forgiven? I have a message on the website. I, I'm not going to get into that now. You reject God the Father as He speaks to you through the prophets, there's forgiveness for that. Hang the Son of God on a cross and kill Him and reject Him. And He prays for the Father to forgive you. You're forgiven of that. But blaspheme the Holy Spirit. There's no forgiveness for that. Now today, a person cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit. It cannot be done because you're not being offered a kingdom. You're not being offered what Israel was being offered. You can't blaspheme the Holy Ghost today. Nobody living in the dispensation of grace has ever blasphemed the Holy Spirit no matter what they said about Him. 
That's not blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit happened at one time in history, right there when they did despite unto the Spirit of grace and they resisted the Holy Spirit and what He was trying to accomplish through them. Does that make sense? See, there's only one thing Israel has coming. As a result of this, verse 30 of that same chapter, Hebrews 10. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. This is in result of this doing despite unto the Spirit of grace. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. The very concept of vengeance and judgment is a concept that is exclusive to Israel. It is not a concept that is identified with the body of Christ. You are not under judgment. Your sins were judged at the cross. Jesus Christ paid for your sins here. And you've been forgiven all trespasses in Christ. See, rightly dividing the word of truth according to God's timeline gives you a great confidence when you read your Bible, when you study your Bible, and you understand what was not written to you. Because I know when I went to preach in Michigan, this was a couple of years ago, and I talked about how Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's a guarantee God gave you. But here in Hebrews 10, for if we sin willfully, after that we've received the knowledge of, there remains no more sacrifice. This lady came up to me after I had preached some of this stuff. She came up to me after the message and said, you'll never believe how, when, where I used to go. And the pastor put me under the condemnation of verse 10, chapter 10, verse 26. And I lived my Christian life for years in fear and petrified that, because I knew I was a sinner. I knew I wasn't a perfect person. I knew I had done things wrong in my life. I knew I was still doing things wrong. I knew I still wasn't perfect. And this verse said that if I sinned willfully, there was no more sacrifice for sins. And I lived in the dread of fear until I found out about the Word of God rightly divided. And when I found the Word of God rightly divided, that those things were not written to me, that Paul was my apostle, and that he had wrote to me about the grace of God, and that I stand in the grace of God, I was liberated and set free from that bondage of fear. <clears throat> Paul, that's why Paul begins his epistles, grace and peace, grace and peace. That's who we are today. We're living in grace and peace with God. I know some of you in this room don't live perfectly, especially you up there. <laughs> <laughs> I know that no one in this room has arrived at sinless perfection, including yours truly. I know that. I understand that. Thank God I understand that. Or I'd be pounding all of you over the head. You know? But I know that none of us have ever arrived at that place where, that they call in the Nazarene church entire sanctification. Where you don't sin anymore. I'm realistic enough to know that not being perfect of myself is not what counts but being perfect in Christ is what counts. I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm complete in Christ. I'm forgiven all trespasses in Christ. And if it were not for that truth, I of all men, like Paul said, would be most miserable. But Jesus Christ paid for my sins. But you don't learn that. You don't learn that here. You don't learn that in the book of Hebrews. You don't learn that in Peter's. We're about to, next week we're going to James. And you don't learn that from James. And you don't learn that from 1 Peter and 2 Peter. 
In second, in first Peter or second Peter, you're, you're, a dog is returning to his vomit. A pig's returning to her wallowing in the mire. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Yeah, you know that word they're talking about. They're talking about here. I'm not talking about, there's no judgment in the house of God here. If there was, every church in America would be burnt to smithereens. Would be nothing but a bunch of ashes. If that was the case, then these preachers who talk about God's judgment, and they don't know what they're talking about. We live in the dispensation of grace. Ephesians 3, 2, a dispensation of the grace of God was committed to me, Paul said, which in other ages was not made known unto the children of men, as it is now made known. So what a great blessing it is for us to understand the word of God rightly divided and to know that God has a timeline. That's how Joni ended up here. She was in this place where the, she was all confused. One day she heard a guy preaching on the internet said, God's timeline. She said, God has a timeline? I didn't know God had a timeline. So she Googled, I lost my faith. Where do I find it? And this website came up and she met this guy and she said, anybody in Connecticut teach what you teach? He said, yeah, there's a guy there, Rodney Bowyer. He's in, he's in the... He's in Hartford somewhere around there and she Googled me and found me and she showed up here one morning and she never left. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Praise the Lord. And then she, when she became to understand the Word of God rightly divided, I mean, that, that liberates you from all the confusion that exists out there. It removes it all. Because you finally understand that there was an apostle who actually spoke to me and he wrote Romans to Philemon. And he said, I speak to you Gentiles. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank God for rightly dividing the word of truth. What a great blessing that has been in my life and I know in many of your lives also and in many of your lives of people online that are listening we had 194 people last week online. So, hi, I don't know who you are, but you're not sending me emails. But anyway, it's good to have you. So, I love preaching about right division because it changed my life. You know, it changed my life. It changed my perception of people, how I viewed them. You know, because when you look at people through the lens of the law, <laughs> man, oh man, get out of the way. It's not a pointer anymore, it is an axe. You know what I mean? It's a baseball bat. You need to change your life or get out. I used to tell people, you don't like it, there's the door. You know, I was like, I would never say that now, you know. But when you look at life from the, the lenses of the law, you're a Pharisee. All you see, like, like these glasses, like were that thick, you know, everything people do is magnified. You know, it's like, yeah, ah, ah, look at you. Ah, you know, it's like, no, really. When you look through the lens of grace, you realize, wait a minute, they're just like you, Rodney. You're just like them. You're all frail. You all fall. You all need grace. You all need God's love. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, we're thankful we can open the Word of God. We're thankful that Jesus Christ died, shed His blood for our sins that through faith in Him, we'd have redemption, even the, even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of God's grace. I pray that anyone hearing the words of this message, if they have not been rightly dividing, that they would see the simple truth that Hebrews was written to the Hebrews, not to the body of Christ in the dispensation of grace. So I pray that these words will be forged upon the tablets of those who have an ear to hear 
and eyes to see. I pray these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.